Hello, everyone. Um, so I realized that discussion might have gone a little bit too fast, especially in the end when uh, we were just trying to finish and run our files. A lot of the commands that I might have said, or I guess just intricacies, might have gotten lost. And so I just made this little video to help you guys out in case you needed a reference or something, um, if you ever forgot some of the crucial commands you needed to run your input files. Um, so if you remember in class, the example we did, um, it looked like this system. There was a boundary over here, a single spring connected to two springs. On this side, there's a fixed boundary condition. And on this side, there's a force. Um, the force applied here is 6,000 newtons. The spring constant is 1,000 newton meters. Um, this one was 500, and this one was 1,000. Um, so this was the problem that we worked on. And the solution input file should look something like this. Um, we, I, I'm going to post this input file on Piazza so you guys can take a look at it and see if the one that you guys did matches mine. Um, so um, as you can see here, I labeled my nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that would be lo node 1, node 2, node 3, and node 4. And then let's actually make those different colors to make it easier to see. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and then my elements, I labeled them 1, 2, and 3. So element 1, element 2, and element 3. Um, so first, I defined my four nodes coordinates of each node, then I decided to split the elements into two sets because two of the elements, elements 1 and 3, both have the same spring constant, which is 1,000, whereas element 2 has the spring constant of 500. Um, and so here we have one set with elements 1 and 3. And so you see here element 1 is connected to node 1 and node 2. Element 3 is connected to node 2 and node 4. Um, and then element 2 is in its own set. Then I set for the first set this as the properties. Um, some of you were getting confused and putting zeros here. Um, this is a little bit different from what we learned in class about the code numbers, where you put zero on inactive degrees of freedom or degrees of freedom that are fixed. In Abacus, you spec this degree of freedom is um, always going to be active um, for every node. And the way you get the boundary condition is by applying the boundary condition itself. So this should always be 1, 1. You should never have a 0 here or you will get weird problems. Um, basically, I think the, the it won't compile. Um, so then I have my second set of spring properties. Um, and then I only have one step here. It's a static problem. And then the boundaries is that I fix node 1 and I fix node 3, which is what we specified in the problem. And then we put a concentrated load on node 4 going in the first direction, which is this way, and with a magnitude of 6,000. Um, so your input file should look something like this. Once you have it, then uh, go and open up your Abacus command line. Um, there are basically three main um, commands that you're going to need to know uh, based on the command line. And these three are all in order to change directories. So first of all, cd dot dot just brings you down a directory. So you see here, I'm in the C directory slash temp. So when I hit enter, then I go down a folder. If I wanted to go back in, then I'll just type CD temp, and I'm in that folder. Um, another one, if you're in a different drive, let's say you're using 
a Z drive instead of C, then you would just type Z um, colon and then hit return. I don't think I have one here, so I'm not going to do anything. I do have a D drive. So uh, let's see. Now that now you can see I'm in my D drive instead of my C drive, um, but my actual files are in C drive. And the last command you're probably going to want to know is dir. It basically just lists out all of the folders or documents that are in the current folder that you're in. So um, I'm going to do dir. And so I'm going to take a look. My files are in this folder here. So I'm going to type that in. So cd documents. Now, uh, users slash Linus slash documents slash 168 spring 2018 slash week one. And now when I do DIR, you can see now I'm listing every, all the files that I have inside this folder. Um, so once you get the command line to get to the folder that your input file is in, um, the commands you, there's three main command, commands that you're going to want to know. Um, so the first is advocates job equals to, then you type in the name of your file, example two. Um, you don't need the .imp extension, advocates already knows. Then you can do data check interactive. So data check basically means, all right, I have my input file. I don't know if it's 100% correct. So Abacus, can you check it for me? So when you run this, um, it will basically check to make sure that you've set all of your properties, you don't have repeating known numbers, et cetera. Um, this interactive means that you can communicate with, the, with Abacus. If you didn't have interactive, and you hit, you just hit return. Then it would just run in the background. Your hands are off, and you can't do anything anymore. Um, this is useful to include because if, say, you wanted to pause um, the solution, then you could pause it. Otherwise, it would just run until either the solution completed or it failed. Um, so, to show you what it looks like with data check, I'm actually going to do something wrong. So let's just take out this portion, save it. So I don't have an element definition, or I don't have properties. I don't have elements for, uh, actually, let's take this one out. So I forget to define properties for element set two. So I run this data check. And you see, it says it exited with errors. Now you can go inside your folder. Abacus spits out all these different files. The one that you really care about is the dat file. This one will tell you what went wrong. So you go ahead and you open it up. Uh, so the first part of the dat file, it will just basically repeat. Um, and look. It says error, element two is missing a property definition. Check element set and element definition. So it tells you what exactly you've done wrong in the input file and what you need to do to fix it. So let's go ahead and put that back in. And uh, let's run it again. So this time it completed. Um, and that's good. So the next step that you're going to want to do is just same commands except instead of data check, just write continue and it will just continue the solution from this point onwards. It's already gone through the abacus input checker and so now you can solve your solution. Hit continue, it completes, and huzzah, you're done. Um, if you're 100% sure that you're input file is correct and you want to just skip over the data check um, you can do that and if you just go straight from here just abacus job equals name of the file interactive and you run it 
it will just run and it'll do the data check and run your your uh, input file automatically. Um, some other commands that are good to know is are let's say you have a really large problem and you basically are afraid that you might run out of the pre-allocated amount of memory given to Abacus. You can say memory equals, let's say, 2 gigabytes, and that way Abacus will know to allocate 2 gigabytes of memory for you to use. Another useful one is in multi-core processing. You can say CPUs equals, I don't know, maybe 4. And that way it will use 4 cores at the same time instead of just running on 1. Um, the only thing to look out for is that if you use more cores, you will use more Abacus tokens. So Abacus, we have a limited number of tokens um, that we can use, especially when you start working in your company. Maybe your company will have like 20 tokens. So when you just run Abacus itself, it will take up five tokens. It will check out five tokens. Um, and so basically in your company, you could only have, if you had 20 tokens, you could only have four people running um, running jobs at the same time. However, if you add extra CPUs, each extra CPU will only add one token to the number that you check out. So if you use CPUs equals two, then you'll check out six tokens. And that way, by using more CPUs, not only will you get a faster runtime, but you'll also free up space for your coworkers to be able to use Abacus as well. Um, so now that you have a working code, you're going to want to open up CAE or Viewer. And the file that you're really interested in is this ODB file. This ODB file basically has all of your output information. So go open up your Abacus CAE or your Abacus Viewer, then do File, Open, um, get to the directory that you're in. And open up that output file. So you see here, this is what the springs look like in the undeformed configuration. And that's denoted by this plot undeformed shape. If you go right below it, you can plot the deformed shape. So now you can see we have our three springs. Um, Element 1, 2, and 3 is the blue. Um, and here you can control what variables you see on the color. So right now it says it's showing the stresses. If you wanted to show the strain or the displacements, hit U, strain. Um, so this is good for taking pictures. Um, but if you want to know what the actual values at the nodes are, there's two ways to do that. You can either go to Tools and Query, and then here you can actually query the node itself. So look, I picked that node, and so the displacement of that node is 4. Um, a better way to do it would be to go to your XY data table. So remember, your history output, these are variables that this is a single variable for the entire system. So, for example, this could be the potential energy of the entire system. Um, and field variables are variables that exist in a field in our system. So these are things like stresses and strains and displacements. So this is what you want, your field output. Um, then you open up your variables. You're going to want to choose unique nodal, and that will just give you the components at that node. And let's say you wanted the displacements and the reaction forces. So you would click reaction force one and spatial displacement U1. Then you could either pick nodes from the viewport or you could go into your node sets. I'm going to just pick all nodes and save it. So this data will be saved in your XY data over here. And then you can go and take a look at each of these. So 
reaction force at this node right here is minus 4,000. The reaction force at node 2 should be 0, and it is. The reaction force at node 3 is minus 2,000. And this makes sense, because if you remember, we applied a 6,000 force on this node right here. So minus 2,000 plus minus 4,000 will equal to minus 6,000. So it all checks out. Um, I think that's basically what you'll need for your homework. Uh, one last thing is that you see here where the nodes, where the elements are right on top of each other. Sometimes it can get messy. So if you only want to show certain elements, you can go up here and this create display group. Click on it and basically you can hide or add certain elements. So let's say I wanted to hide this element. I would remove it and now it only shows the all the other elements. Um, you can add it back. You could also do it with part instances. Um, so yeah, that's about it. I hope that helps and uh, good luck on your homework.